This was my first trip to Sub-Saharan Africa and I'm gonna share it with you. Take you through a first-hand experience from the airport to the accommodations, to transportation, to the people, the culture, and the must-see sites. Take a look, tell me what you think, figure out if you even wanna visit, figure out what you'll need on your trip. Happy to hear your feedback. It's a proper modern airport that you'd expect to see in any major city in the West, whether it's LAX, Chicago, Atlanta. Looks just like that. You can stop in, get a phone with a SIM card, make sure that you're connected to data and cellular service. What shocked me at the airport is it's mostly a bunch of retired white folks, mostly Europeans, because apparently Americans don't pop through Africa like that. But you don't see a lot of uh, black Africans from other nations coming into South Africa, mostly Europeans. And now we've talked about the airport. Once you arrive in South Africa, what do you want next? You want to get a hotel. In my case, I first stayed at an Airbnb and then I moved into a hotel. My Airbnb was in a neighborhood in Johannesburg, the locals call it Josie, in a neighborhood called Maboning, which is a very much so artsy hipster district that has restaurants and looks like any street you might find in Los Angeles that's popping. And you'll notice that you clearly have a mix of the old African culture with the modern, but I'll get to that in a second. Check out this cool Airbnb place. And then after that, I'll show you a look at the hotel that I stayed in, which was a little closer to the airport. Okay, just got to the spot in South Africa. It's extremely player. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you that. A super big screen. Oh, and check out this, uh, this bath is dope. I like that shower, but it's the bed I like. The elevation. You definitely don't want to roll off that joint in the middle of the night, I'll tell you that right now. There you go. The whole thing is bordered with a city view. Kitchen and the retro refrigerator. South African, I guess, hotel, I guess we're in. So now you've got a chance to see those accommodations and the remarkable thing about it is that you're really staying in a place that gives you Western quality, as nice as any hotel room that you'll find in the US or Europe, but the price is much cheaper. In fact, I'm hoping to go back one day, maybe in Joburg or Cape Town and spend a month. It costs you about 700 US dollars a month for a lovely place. The only thing is that you'll have to get a unique travel adapter, kind of like this one. You can't really use those universal adapters because South Africa has their own uh, outlet, which is quite unique. Uh, here's a sneak look at you know the street below the Airbnb. Now, I know you're really excited to check out these must-see sites, right? You know, all the things you wanna to tour. Now with Africa, generally it's portrayed to be very rural. So I think in South Africa, it's worth first taking a look at the economic development that is the downtown area. So the first thing we did is we went to a high rise, in fact, the highest building in South Africa, which is supposedly also the highest building in the continent of Africa. It was pretty high. You'll hear a voice. That's the voice of a private tour guide that we hired to literally spend the entire day with us. I'm talking about like a 13, 14 hour day. And I want to say that cost us about $80 US per person for two persons. Okay, so you'll hear him. He'll tell you about downtown. The northern part of Jordan, okay? So right in the back, you can see the isolated building, which is right alone, standing alone. At the back. So that is the certain city. That is the richest square mile in Africa. Which one? Um, the building right to the back, in the mist. Oh, in the mist, uh -huh. way back there. Yes. So okay. that is the richest square mile in Africa. It was discovered in 1975. And today it's one of the areas which makes a very, very big difference in the city. So a lot of people, when they want uh, to make deals, this is where they meet. All the very rich shops, which you can think about, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Pierre Cardin, 
this studio and all in there. So it's one of the most expensive uh, summer in the city. And also when it comes to apartments, when it comes to shopping, when it comes to food. So we have the eastern part of Johannesburg. You see, when Johannesburg was discovered, it was a grassland, very, very flat, ideal place for so many people who could farm. Okay. So eventually, when the gold was discovered in 1886, that's when a lot of people developed interest of coming into the city. I thought it was worth first starting the Masi sites with the downtown because you know, some folks would portray Africa as jungles and forests. So I think it's worth seeing that. Now that we know what there is in the way of economic development, let's get to those other must-see sites. And we're going to start with Nelson Mandela in Santon. Santon is the wealthiest square mile in the whole continent of Africa. As you can imagine, it's overwhelmingly white. A lot of the folks who are still there from the colonial era and uh, so, you know, that's that. But curiously, in the mall in Santon, there's about a 30 foot tall statue of Nelson Mandela. And you'll find that much of the sites and tourist uh, attractions in South Africa circle around Nelson Mandela and the ANC activities and the apartheid regime. Curiously, no matter what museum you go to, you're pretty much finding that South Africans almost have their history starting with apartheid. They rarely go back into the tribal era, era, era or to any of the monarchs, the Zulus, the great warriors that predate apartheid, which is really curious. Welcome to Soweto, a remarkable township. And uh, you'll see a picture of me standing in front of one of the oldest communities in Soweto, which is essentially a community of shacks and uh, tremendous levels of what we would consider poverty in the West. Uh, but the people are you know, very friendly and kind and pretty much mind their own business, aren't asking you for a change when you go through there. They're just going about their lives. Soweto is remarkable because it is very prominent in the history of apartheid ending. This is the township in the city where the student protests occurred. And there's also a museum there, which you should definitely check out, which has a lot of photographic documentation of the protests um, that occurred, but also the brutality of apartheid that led up to uh, the end of apartheid. Now, curiously, one thing you'll notice is that uh, there's a monument that explains how a young man carried his brother's dead body back to his village. And they have a quotation from the mother explaining that we should not hold my son up in high regard because he brought the dead body of his brother back after he was killed by you know, one of the white agents of the apartheid government. But the reason that he brought his brother's dead body back is because in our tribe, we are responsible for one another. If he didn't bring his brother back alive or dead, if he didn't come back with his brother, he wouldn't be allowed to come back. I think those are true African values, that, that loyalty is deep. I think even when you find urban areas in America, we have the same values, which is be for your brother. One of the unsurprising things about South Africa is that you'll find a lot of rubbish on the ground, whether you're in Soweto or any of the other less developed neighborhoods. And that's because the garbage collection either doesn't exist or is insufficient. So you'll find a often a lot of open fires where folks are literally burning their trash. So be very thankful that you're in a country where they collect the trash, so toss it in a trash can, just a side note. Also, uh, another uh, very interesting thing that you can do while in South Africa is to go to the home of Nelson Mandela. This is his home that he occupied after coming out of prison <laughs> doing that long bid. And you'll go through the home and it has a lot of you know, memorable uh, moments in his life, whether it's photographs with Fidel Castro or historical figures throughout the world. Nelson did some time. He was 45 when he went in. He was 70 some when he went out. I don't think I could have done that kind of time. Nelson Mandela moved into 8115 Orlando West with his first wife. Is extremely rotten. So it's the state of Michigan legislatures petitioning the U.S. federal government 
to admit that and apologize that the CIA helped put Nelson Mandela in prison in cooperation with the apartheid government. Teachers have all the rights of the citizens. Does that mean if I come here, I can go to your hospital and get the same? Exactly. Does that mean I can marry two wives here since polygamy is legal here? <laughs> exactly. Well, I just might do it then, okay.